Okay, so just like I've talked to you in the past, right? I don't like to waste time when it comes to, you know, like lecturing and just giving you information, okay? What I'm giving you is important. Uh, it's important for a reason. It's going to help you, right? So talking about proportion, right? It's all about like parts to the whole. So I promise it's not gonna be too much fractional stuff and mathematics stuff, because that breaks our heads usually, right? Uh, this is kind of like, in my estimation, artist-friendly mathematics, but it's going to help you over time develop a vernacular of sizing things against other things. Eventually, you're not going to need tools for this. That's my hope. Um, most students don't need their viewfinder and don't use a lot of the tools that I, that I teach in the beginning as we move on, right? No, I'm not going to make you learn how to read a tape measure, but man, it's so important. This skill is like a big deal, right? Um, so talking about just within a two inch span, right? Um, if we've got something that looks like it would be two inches in front of us, and by two inches I'm not talking about like this big, you know, but we might pencil sight or look at something that could be like two inches in the distance kind of thing. And maybe we've got something that is an inch in that same picture plane. There's two ways to go about thinking of this. You could either choose your basic unit of measure as one inch, and then measure everything else off of that to determine how tall and big and bulky everything else should be. So like, for instance, if I'm, if I'm looking at Tony's uh, pencil box there, and I can see that at a certain height or whatever or width, and then I look at the sketchbook, the sketchbook would be bigger than the pencil box, right? So it works better for me to use the smaller unit of measure to decide how many of those would fit into the larger thing. Some people think backwards. Um, I just can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't look at something and go, well, that, you know, I look at that and go, okay, that's, you know, that's about half of that. For me, it's way easier to say two of those fit in there. So generally, you want to choose a basic unit of measure that's um, going to be some shape, some subject selection in your composition, and you will base that measurement to determine how tall, big, or whatever everything else is in the composition. Um, so, again, I say it's smaller, but maybe that's a hard thing for you to wrap your mind around. Maybe you think backwards, right? I don't want to force you to think in a way that is reverse to the way you normally think, okay? So the, the example I give here, it's not an awesome example, is like if you, if you have an apple in your composition and it's the smallest unit or a unit that looks like it fits within other units really easily, right? Um, so like if I've got an apple, I don't know, let's see, it's not paying attention. Oh, yeah, <laughs> then she looks up. Okay, so Kate's got an apple on her desk, right? And I measure that, and I'm like, okay, well that apple looks like about the size of Kate's head. And then I can go, okay, well, how many, how many heads tall or whatever, or how many apples tall? But if I have something that's like 1 17th of the size of Kate, that's gonna be very difficult for me to factor quickly, right? 1 17th is not something that we really can see on here. So it's not easy to do, right? So we take a lot of measurements in the beginning before we start making choices. Y'all have probably seen these images before, right? Okay? They're not just like cute little Pinterest backgrounds and things like that. These are important Da Vinci sketches. Um, we use measurement in almost everything that we do, right? If we're gonna draw objectively, we have to think about what we can use to create relationships within everything else. So the, the face, very important. We use eyes a lot, right? A lot of you have portrait drawing experience from the past, right? And I'm sure you've heard that whole thing about taking the eyes and working that against other things. Is this sounding familiar to any of you? This is where you bob your head and like, oh, I have no idea, or yes, I totally get what you're saying. Thank you, Brian, for illuminating this. You don't have to say all that, it's hard to remember. We always want to determine that. Like for instance, one thing that I always start with when I'm drawing a portrait is I figure out how wide an eye ought to be, and then I make sure that I start in the center between the eyes because you have exactly, almost exactly, one eye width between your eyes. So if you've ever had a situation where you're drawing a portrait and you're like, man, the eyes look weird, they're too big or like too, too far apart or whatever, it might have to do with the fact that you're not looking at how big those eyes are to determine what the relationship is between, right? And looking at Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, uh, he did a lot with anatomy, right? But it's really hard to look at that, I mean, unless you can read Latin and read it backwards. Um, there's a lot of way more handy illustrations about figure drawing. So this is actually something that you're going to be putting in your sketchbook. I don't think you need to write all this down, 
but a couple of pretty handy things to, to think about are that, well, how, how many of you know about this like figure drawing thing? Like how many heads tall would a typical human being? Seven or eight, right? Okay, so that's kind of a normal get that, right? Anything bigger than that is going to be that heroic stature. So, like, if you know, if you've ever seen Michelangelo's Dave, he's huge because his head's huge, but he's also nine tall because he's like heroic or whatever. Um, so, when we look at this, because the man's head is going to be larger or whatever, he's going to be tall. Um, and it's really the same thing for females. And that's relative, it's not like perfect and the same, but that's a basic unit of measure. So when we draw the figure, it's important for us to know how large that head's gonna be so that we can dictate how the rest of the body is going to work off of that, right? Pencil sighting. So I talk about this a lot, but we haven't really dealt with this, okay? How many of you are familiar with pencil sighting? Like a lot of you? Okay, it's really hard for me to illustrate this to you because it's very hard for you to see from my perspective. It absolutely matters like how close you are to what you're measuring and what your experience is doing that. So I like this illustration because the dude is showing us his, his arm is outstretched. Anytime you're using pencil sighting, you want it outstretched because you want to always have the same sensibility about perspective, right? Um, so like if I want to measure the height of Joseph's face, and you're getting weirded out now, aren't you? Um, it's going to change if I get this close, okay? And I'm not going to be able to remember what this feels like, right? But this is a limitation that I really can't control. Like, this is the end of my arm. My body says, hey, you can't go any further, right? Um, probably good for Josie's sake. When my arm is flying off. I would never hurt you, Josie. Um, <laughs> but what I do is I place the tip of my pencil at the very top of Josie's head. I take my thumb, I move it up until I hit the chin, right? So that's kind of what this is illustrating here. Dude's looking at a cone, he's got the very top of it on the top of the cone, and he moves his finger down like this, okay? And that's important for us to know when we're using, uh, when we're using those basic units of measure. Um, how many have worked with a grid before? Like grid drawing, you know? Like you take an example or whatever, and you grid something out, and then you look at that relationship of how contours move through the grid, or um, sometimes students will like draw square by square, right? Anybody ever like tried that out before? Okay, so what happens when you draw square by square? Like what's the end result gonna look like in your, in just in your experience? Is it pretty faithful to look just like the picture or is something weird happening there? Like don't be shy. I always have to go back and fix stuff once the grid's gone because it doesn't line up the way I want it to. Okay. And I don't, like what I see a lot of times, because I, I used to teach a lot of grid drawing, like my middle school, early high school stuff. We get these really nice squares. You get like 40 nice compositions, but they don't fit together, not very well. So you get this kind of like grid sensibility happening. But the grid helps us, helps us a lot. Um, Renaissance artists use this all the time. A device that they used to make would be like a frame, okay? And they would drill holes at very regular intervals in the top, the sides, and then they would string like cat gut or tennis. That's what they use for tennis rackets and things. Some kind of a string that goes all the way through, so they have a grid in front of them. So then they would set their models up in front of them. They'd place that like on their easel or their desk or whatever, and then they can physically like look at how that drops on top of their their uh, subject, and then on the paper, canvas, or whatever, they've got that grid going really light. To use that effectively, you really shouldn't be going square by square, right? Because our analytical side of our brain kicks in and we're more concerned about what counting, right? So if I use a grid, a lot of times I'll think, okay, things are going well. And then I, I, I go maybe like a few grids over and down and then things are like way off. And it's because I'm, I'm too busy counting, I'm not perceiving, right? So the viewfinder helps us with two things, right? It helps us with developing a picture plan. Okay. Like right now, our whole experience, right? We see everything to the edges, we see everything we're focusing on. And it's hard to stay focused in. We've been doing a lot of exercises where you have to follow a contour, you have to follow interior contours. And that's kind of like mentally draining a little bit, right? I mean, at least it is for me. Sometimes you feel, I feel kind of exhausted from doing those. But the picture plan simplifies it for us. 
okay? So that's why we use the viewfinder. We're not gonna use it forever. We're gonna use it to help us get started. Eventually, this viewfinder will become an imaginary viewfinder in front of you. Okay. One thing it's also going to help us with is proportion. Because we are going to use a very simplified grid pattern within here. We're going to be drawing basically like a plus sign through here, and it's going to completely quarter this, right? That way, we're not thinking about a million little things that we're counting. We're just going to be looking at quadrants, and that will help us place things on the picture plan. You remember last week when we did the uh, continuous edge exercises, and some of you had this experience where, like, maybe you start on the bottom, things looked really good, but as you went to the top, it like warped and got bigger or weirder, you know, or it was hard to keep it in the picture plan. This helps us to determine what we're drawing and what those parameters are for that, right? And then the, the crossbars, things like that, that's really like when we get into perspective, that's gonna help us a lot with like uh, horizon line vanishing point, those types of things, right? Okay, so this is what we're constructing when it comes to that. Today, um, we're going all the way from building this to creating some kind of either a still life that you wanna do in here. If you do that, I'd rather you did like groups of four, maybe take a desk, set it up in the corner or something, make it interesting. A variety of shapes and sizes of things overlap so that you actually have this challenge of matching up some of those differences, right? Or if you choose to work independently, um, kind of like what I'm demonstrating today, you'll find some places within the art and design department that have various sized items and objects that you can draw and you can bring things out there to kind of mix that up as well. Okay? So when I, when I develop and, uh, or when I, when I lecture that, you'll, you'll be able to understand how you're going to be developing your picture plane uh, and pushing from beginning to end to a drawing shape. Which by the way, I've been kind of like no erasers for a long time, right? Yeah, I'm chilling out on that now. We're in week four, so you can use your erasers. I'm not gonna holler at you, I promise. Um, so, corrections, all that kind of stuff. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a quick viewfinder demonstration. It's real simple, right? Um, got a whole bunch of cutting mats out, so you can just convert your station here into a cutting mat to go for this thing. On the inside doesn't really matter that much. Okay, so protect your board. This is how we do mats too. Start on that edge, pierce it, and slowly go until you get to the end. If you go just a little bit past the end, you're good to go. Try to be really clean about this, right? Because you'll use these for a bit. And of course, always use a cutting mat, please and thank you. So the inside of these are 10 by 12. So I promised you we wouldn't do difficult math today, but what's half of 10? Awesome. Bree's just looking at me like, really? <laughs> what's half of 12? Six. Six! Who said that? So you're gonna use this uh, acetate here. And really the easiest way to do this is to Lay your template on there. It's like pretty much the exact same size as this width. So you can't mess it up too bad. Then just trace that off. Cut that off. Now we used to glue this and I realized, oh, you can't really glue this acetate very well. So we're just going to tape it on there. Okay, so next step here, you're gonna wanna make some double-sided sticky tape. So just take some little bits of this, roll it, make it pretty tight. I'd make about five of those, maybe six of those. And that's gonna kinda tack it to the borders. Yeah, we, we hot glued them last year and they just fell apart. I figured hot glue would completely melt this stuff, but no. I'll make it like they used to. So put these on the corners to start with. Try to get them really flat so they're not like sculptural. 
and then I would suggest at least one on the long sides. If you're really wanting to do a thorough job of this, go ahead and put some here too. And then what you want to do is kind of gently place that on there. And then once you get a good corner on there, you can stick down the other corner to make sure it's like really straight. And then you're going to go ahead and get the edges here. So, you see how I did that? Pretty simple, right? So the way that I do this part here, I've got a little bit of plastic hanging over. I'm going to get rid of that. You want it to be about the same shape. Because if it hangs over, it's going to be hard not to get it to buckle. So I put it kind of like half on, half hanging over. And then you're just going to take it and fold it over like that. You're going to do that all the way around. It is important to make sure you go all the way out to the edges here, but I'm just getting this started for posterity's sake, get it done quickly. Trim your excess. Okay, again, well, it's very fascinating to watch me demonstrate this. I'm probably not going to finish it all up for you. You get the idea, right? So we're going to do this all the way around, okay? Your last step is that you're going to go ahead and make that crosshair, right? So we said earlier, five inches. Well, that's not ten. It's pretty close to ten. Go five inches in here. So we need to have two marks in there, and I'll kind of come around and help you all with this. So you want to do this on the inside. I mean, I guess you don't have to. You could do it on this side if it's easier for you. I'm going to split the difference between this here, about a quarter inch either side. And again, we're not doing a full grid on here, so like as long as you've got it roughly in the middle here, five and six, should be good to go. Okay. So, that's that. Only you're gonna have this all the way around, right? Cool. Okay.